So you want to go to their spot? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, Jeremy's all over it. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're good. Yeah, oh, no. it's not a happy game or happy. Oh, I kept waiting for an upbeat in your talk. There is a one. Let's see. Um, if you're sitting in here, I have a handout. If you're not sitting in here, welcome to a handout. I think I, I have enough. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're splitting up into three groups and you're staying there. So unlike earlier where you're going to rotate between the three rooms, now you have to pick. So your three options um, are in the three different classrooms. So in here is Jeremy and Aquaponics and Aquaculture. He teaches eighth grade. Um, Eighth, ninth, so, tenth, eleventh, and all of the above. Um, but so that gives you kind of an outline of what grade level. Um, and then next door is Bill Hodges, and he's teaching about biomagnification, so how those toxins and things build up through the food chain into the salmon. Um, and more high school. And then around the corner, and Paul just snuck out again, um, is the biologist from the flat. River State Factory, and he's going to be doing a lesson on the daily thermal units. So, if you like data and having your kids crunch numbers and that cross curricular to math, um, definitely go hang out with Paul. Plus, he's actually a biologist, so you can ask him fun questions. Um, so, those are your three options. So, aquaculture in here, biomagnification next door, or around the corner in that end room is uh, the daily thermal units. So, how they measure when the salmon is. So if you want to go pick a classroom, you'll be all set. How much time do you want me to give them before I go? 30 seconds. <laughs> yes, you're stuck here. You just go or stay. All right, so I'll start talking. Um, in front of you is a sheet of paper. It's got a lot of contact information for me, uh, my website. Basically what it is is just a whole lot of stuff I've dumped on our school's classroom uh, website. And then also there's some things on there as far as uh, I have a social media site. I was just telling Aaron about, um, I use Facebook. This is the very first year I decided that I was going to go to social media and use it for a positive thing in my classroom. Uh, so I have a Facebook page for my classroom. I got media releases for every single one of my kids. Uh, I had a piece of paper that I filled out, uh, had parents fill out for this, uh, with the syllabus, and it was two little boxes. Uh, I agree to allow my kid pictures to be used for social media release, or I do not. I did not have a single parent in any of my classes that said I do not want my kid, uh, their pictures to be used for social media release. Um, and there was a number of other things I asked for permission for on that as well. It's kind of just the beginning of the year syllabus thing that sent home with everyone had a sign that came back. And I got every single one of them back, and every single person said it was okay. So I'm rolling with that. So you're free to check that out. Um, I also have all of the same information on my Twitter feed as what I have on my classroom Facebook page. Uh, and basically what it is is it's just an opportunity for me to share with the community what I'm doing in my classroom and why I'm doing it. Um, I know oftentimes we get community members that start questioning what's going on in the classroom, why are we doing what we're doing. How come we're not doing more activities like this or like that? Um, I have justification on that as to why and how we're doing things. Uh, and that kind of led to some of the things that we're doing with aquaculture and aquaponics. Um, I really like hands-on learning. I really enjoy my kids getting involved in tinkering with things and exploring things. Um, I am a modeling instructor, uh, so I've got quite a bit of background in modeling instruction. Uh, if you aren't or familiar with the American Modeling Teachers Association, get into that. It's a pretty cool organization. Uh, they've got some great resources, um, and specifically a pedagogy, pedagogy for, uh, for instruction. Um, yeah, so where are we located at? That's us, right in the middle of the mitten. Um, we are an extremely small district. We graduate between 35 and 45 students per year. Um, we actually make up about three different small towns, and we're mostly rural, 
uh, mostly a rural farming community. Um, my Facebook page is there, my Twitter information is there. Feel free to peruse those things while I'm talking. Uh, this is kind of an overview of where I'm going, what is aquaponics, why aquaponics, standards. Um, and I'm not going to spend much time on standards, I'm just going to show you a picture of all the standards that I use to justify what I'm doing. Um, this project really came out of salmon in the classroom. I'm going to talk on the next slide about where, where I've been um, and the transition from salmon in the classroom as an eighth grade project and how we scaffolded it into what we're doing with aquaponics and aquaculture in the high school. Uh, big, this big part of it was every year I was having nitrogen issues inside of tanks and I was like, man, there's got to be another way to try to get rid of nitrogen out of the system. Um, I know there's a couple other teachers. Um, I've shared some of this information down at MSCA last year. There's a couple other teachers in the Detroit area that have adapted and are using some of these things to try to minimize the amount of nitrogen uh, waste that's inside of their system as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the systems as a whole and then finding funding, if this is something that you're trying to do and how to go about uh, getting funding, and then some of the different challenges that you might run into if this is something you're trying to use with your salmon thing. Um, social media has been my best friend for things. Um, this project, we use rainbow trout in our system. Um, in our rainbow trout, we purchase through a hatchery in Utah. Um, I usually don't purchase them until I sell a couple of things out of our greenhouse and we, do a, we end up purchasing eggs later on in the year. Uh, there's some red tape as far as getting eggs transported across state lines. Um, you have to get some clearance from the DNR for some fish health information and then you also have to get some permitting through the Department of Agriculture. But so far they've been super cool with what we're doing with aquaponics. So if you're interested in Kind of going through that process and maybe looking at rainbow trout seeing me, I'd be glad to explain that entire process to you. Uh, this right here is just simply our system. Um, I'll, I'll show some more pictures on it. This right here is a 15 foot Intex system that is just growing lettuce. That's all romaine lettuce growing there. Uh, and I think in that picture too, um, I do have over here some green beans that we're trying to grow. They didn't work out real well. Cold water systems, lettuce is the way to go. Uh, if you can find somebody that will that likes romaine lettuce, you can get rid of it uh, like crazy, especially when you get like E. coli outbreaks like a couple weeks ago. Everyone in the community is like, hey, you got any of that romaine lettuce? I can't get it from anywhere else. I sure do. Um, as, far as, as far as where we've been, we started with salmon in the classroom. I think this is my 13th year, but you know, it kind of all blends together. I've had more failure than I'd like to admit. Um, but also there is a lot of learning and failure, and I think sometimes as teachers we're like, oh man, we failed. Well, let's talk about why. Didn't we learn more about why we failed than they did just, hey, we had a really cool end product that we would let a bunch of fish go. Maybe you start wrestling with what was, the, what was happening in that system, and how can I relate that system to this natural world system, and what are the effects? Um, what happens if a farmer takes a whole lot of fertilizer and goes and dumps it out on the field, and they don't inject it into the soil? And then we have a really bad freeze, or they, they put the fertilizer on the field after a really bad freeze. And then we have a downpour of rain. Where's all that fertilizer go? Um, these are great lessons for kids in the classroom. Um, so that's just a link right there to the, um, to the DNR's SIC website, Saving the Classroom website. You're probably all very familiar with it. Um, our Saving the Classroom project started as a small classroom. It just started in my room. And then we started to see, I started to see some ways to branch it out into our other middle school classrooms. Uh, we do a bunch of things in the language arts classroom with it, uh, where kids take all of the data that they've collected, they analyze it, they interpret it, and then they write an argumentative piece in the language arts classroom. Uh, we do a bunch of things with social studies. Uh, we, we talk about the politics of it, we talk about geography. Um, in the math classroom, we take a lot of the data that we collect on a day-to-day -day basis, and we run with it at math. And then the kids are looking at it going, oh, this isn't just a bunch of numbers on a sheet. This is applicable. How can I reason out what's happening in my tank? If I have data to support what we're, what we're seeing and the outcomes that we're seeing. Um, so our project has slowly changed year after year after year. I'm running for salmon in the classroom. I'm running five tanks. And it's because every couple of years, I go purchase a new tank. I go get another grant. And I'm like, hey, I want to get another tank to make it bigger. So then I have to have fewer kids working on one tank. I would not recommend that right away. It is pretty extensive as far as trying to keep track of everything. Uh, one of our tanks, 
go along with it. Uh, other ones are doing really well. We have one group of kids. We don't have any fish in that tank. Um, and ours it was the custodians came in over Christmas break, and I had a list for them to do, and they were gonna they were gonna help me out. I, I think they they misread the part where I said a pinch of food. Um, and the tanks that said do not feed because the fish weren't buttoned up yet, they still have my food. And that was a bad situation when I came back two days before break was over. Um, so yeah, we have, we've got one tank that doesn't have uh, fish in it right now. Um, but it'll have fish in it in a little while. Um, PD for Chippewa River writing project, that's something that I, I helped with as well. Uh, Beaver Island Institute, this is my, my plug. Um, if you are interested in spending a week on Beaver Island, uh, at CMU Biological Station, I helped facilitate a PD there. Um, feel free to sing me about that super cool opportunity. Zero cost to teachers. Uh, you just have to show up for a week. Um, and then we're really with this project with our aquaponics specifically trying to bridge the gap between what did we learn in eighth grade or seventh grade or sixth grade with our same in the classroom project, and how can we apply that to some other hands-on activity in our ninth grade with our real science project. Uh, so this is just a picture of the kids doing macroinvertebrate studies or the salmon in the classroom stuff at the end of the year. I'll talk more about the lab stations that we do tomorrow. Uh, this is a picture of where we release our, our fish. This is Fish Creek in Hubbardston, Michigan. Um, there's a nice little dam right there. We release all of our fish right below it. We have a number of people from the DEQ, uh, the Michigan Sea Grant, other schools, and then our local um, community foundation helps with this project as a whole. Our salmon getting released. So, what is aquaponics? Uh, aquaponics is a system that uses wastewater from some type of organism, usually fish, uh, and we are using that waste from those organisms to grow some form of plant. There are all kinds of ways that you can go with aquaponics. Um, most of our systems were raising either cherry tomatoes or lettuce because I found they grow the best in cold water systems. If you're looking at going a warm water system and you want to get like ornamental fish or you want to do something that's a little bit different, uh, maybe tilapia would be something that you could, you could raise where the water temperature gets a lot higher. Uh, you can do some other varieties of plants, but the lettuces, some of the herbs, um, tomatoes all tend to really do really well, uh, at least in our aquaponics system. Um, and the system helps with the nitrogen cycle. Uh, we are all familiar with the nitrogen cycle. Fish produce ammonia. Ammonia produces nitrite, nitrite produces nitrate, plants uptake the nitrate, they use it for um, synthesis of different proteins and for DNA production, uh, and they grow. So it's one way for me to get rid of all the nitrate. I don't have to do water change ups on my aquaponics system, but maybe once every two to three months. Uh, I just don't have to because the system is cycling that out uh, really well. Uh, this is a picture right here of our rainbow trout eggs when we first got them. Uh, those two cool pictures I threw it in there. Um, this is some plants that we started. We started them in soil and then transplanted. We've gotten a lot better at starting plants. We use vermiculite, the light, the um, type material, grow seeds in it, flow water, and if they start sprouting, we can transplant them. Um, so why aquaponics? Uh, we felt that we were able to do some things in varying grade levels as well. Currently, we're really focusing in on the earth science area. Um, earth science, biology, environmental science, chemistry of water, physical science, family and consumer science. You talk about eating a product or eating vegetables or even a fish production in the long run. You can eat those. Uh, business classes. There's so many ways that you can use this uh, at the cross-curricular activity or just simply in science class. Uh, and it's hands-on with some real-world connections um, and... Kids love food. I mean, we know that. Talk about middle schoolers or high schoolers wanting food. That's kind of their thing, right? Um, this is a small system that I had a couple students set up, um, and I'll show a picture of that again later. Basically, what is it? it is. There's a tank down below. There's a pump that runs water up to the top of that. The water is going through the PVC. Uh, there are net pots. Net pots are just little circular pots with a bunch of holes in them. And then inside each net pot is expanded clay pellets. Expanded clay pellets give, uh, they're, they're airy. They have a lot of pore space in them. Bacteria start growing on the, the pore spaces. And so as that water runs through it, the bacteria are doing all the things that bacteria do to convert uh, that ammonia into a usable form for plants and plants that are up here. 
Um, it is important for your plants to also get oxygen to their roots. Uh, and so we have found that sometimes if you've got a system that is flooding all the time, uh, your plants don't grow quite as well. Uh, so like our pool system, we kind of have some issues with some, some plant growth, growth in that one. So these are just growing in our pool. Science standards, I'm gonna cruise through these really quickly. You, I mean, you guys are all science standard out, right? Um, there are so many standards that can be met uh, with an aquaponic system. Uh, inquiry education, food nutrition, measurements, all kinds of life lessons. I will tell you, failure happens every day. I fail a lot. I have killed more fish than I want to admit. Um, but also through that process, there have been situations where my kids have learned and they have a very good conceptual understanding of the nitrogen cycle and other biological cycles that are happening. Um, Again, kind of same thing. Connection to real world class processes, applying your independent research. I love kids with research. Like, hey, we're in earth science. This is your all your project for the entire semester. Have fun with it. Uh, there is a competition that Lake Superior State University puts on. Uh, I've got some information regarding that. Uh, very cool project. My kids, I'll show a picture of the, the Grand Champion Aquaponic System from last year. Uh, I have three kids. One of them was an exchange student that won that project last year. And I've got a team coming back this year. So, bring it on. Um, very cool group of kids, and, and they really enjoyed that, that particular competition. Um, this is just a small system that kids set up for my plants, but they're just foam, expanded foam boards that you just use on the outside of your house. Same stuff that you get at Home Depot or Menards. Um, that right there, I think, was three quarter inch board. We took a uh, two inch, uh, three inch hole saw, drilled a hole in, uh, in the foam board, put that, the net pot fit in perfectly. Put a little expanded clay pellets on there because you, your plants already started. You put them down in. Uh, this student was using goldfish, um, and she got some plants going. Uh, you do get to a point in small systems like this where your, your fish may not produce enough nitrogen um, or produce enough ammonia to get your plants growing real well. So they'll, they'll get five, six, seven inches tall and they'll kind of fizzle out. Um, but it's still kind of cool learning opportunity for those kids. That's a, a picture of two kids that. Were, they thought they were pretty cool in their system, it was pretty awesome. Um, so their system is just kind of the same thing there. Uh, you can see just the tank and then um, foam board on top with a bunch of net pots sitting on that foam board, floating it right on the regular tank. Um, that's really what I would recommend if you're interested in trying to do this with a salmon tank. Romaine lettuce, foam board, net pots, throw a bunch of expanded clay pellets in there, get your lettuce growing, um, get them sprouted, put them in there. You're, you're, as long as you have sufficient sunlight um, or some type of grow light, uh, they're going to grow. I will caution, if you have a greenhouse, you will find algae starts growing like crazy inside your water as well. Um, so the way that you combat that is you paint your tank blue. Um, you can get a, some type of roller or anything like that just to paint the outside of the tank blue. It'll minimize algae growth. So systems can be extremely small. I'm just going to go through a bunch of these systems that I had kids set up. That's just a bunch of aquariums, and then they just did expanded um, uh, board, expanded foam board um, with, with uh, net pots in it, and expanded clay pellets. Um, that's just another one, and another one. And this, this group ended up being far away from the window, so they had put an artificial light on it. Same thing here. I think they did. I think they were growing soybeans. Uh, I will caution you though, uh, I, I heard that this happens oftentimes in districts with ag type programs. Um, be mindful of the type of seeds that might show up in your classroom if you know what I'm saying. Uh, we had that experience the very first year that I, I uh, was doing this project. I had to be Johnny on the spot on it. So really easy to go identify. Um, so the system's going to be small like this right here as well. Uh, so this system right here has a bunch of expanded clay pellets at the top, a pump that's kicking the water up into the, the top expanded clay pellets, and then the water's just draining out of the, the other side. Super easy to run something like that on top of your salmon thing. Same thing with this. This is the uh, aquaculture challenge group from last year. Uh, so their system, we built everything out of lumber. And then just on the inside of it, they took uh, like a food grade liner and ran that food grade liner all the way through the inside, folded it over, stapled it on top, and put another piece of board on top. A pump down below, 
pump is running up into another tank up here where all of there's it's just full of expanded clay pellets. They wanted to try a bunch of different things, so they tried corn in it. Uh, they tried uh, kale. Kale grows really well in these things. Why anybody eats kale, I don't know, but it grows really well in these things. Um, if you you like your quick kale chips, get knocked upon it, so sure. Um, and romaine lettuce was in that one as well. Here's that system again when it first started. And there's the system I showed earlier. Right now we have strawberries in that one. Those are all strawberries. Strawberries are not real hardy. Uh, there's some kind of tricks to being able to do strawberries. Um, I've got resources up here that I'll show you in a little bit as far as the places you can go. YouTube is one of the best places to find information uh, on growing plants. What size uh, fish tank was that big uh, one? Um, so most of the tanks we use are 10 gallon tanks, uh, so they're mostly small. The largest one I have is a 55 gallon tank that they, they could set up. Um, the, the problem with larger tanks is, yeah, you have more surface area, but when things go bad, they're bad. Um, and so I, I try to keep most kids kind of small. It was easier to siphon out water, it's easier to trans, uh, transplant things, there's not as much stuff to deal with. Um, so they can be small. I like the small ones. They're easier to deal with as a student, but they're also easier to deal with as a teacher. They can also be big, though. This is a system my students uh, designed, engineered, instructed, put together. We had all kinds of failures and learning opportunities. Uh, I would tell you when you go to put a pump on a system like this, you don't have to go bigger is better. I thought you had to go bigger is better. I'm like, we've got a big system. We need a big pump. So we bought a pump that, uh, that moves uh 7400 gallons per hour it was way too much uh so i had to like plumb in where i ran a bunch of pipes and a bunch of valves and so the pump continue i still have that pump on there but it pumps water right through the sump tank over and over and over again and then some of it is allowed up into the fish tank so that right there is just the base of our system uh so each one of those are four by four by four so it's 16 feet long by four feet wide uh, and we just use IBC totes. We got a hold of the local elevator, like, hey, got any old IBC totes that you guys used for anything that was somewhat food grade that wouldn't be like, hey, we just got a whole bunch of Roundup that was in there. And they're like, yeah, sure, we got some. sent some over to us for free. That was very kind of them. This is a kid just building the frame. They cut off the, some of the housing. Um, we used those for various reasons. Um, we can see the kids starting to set that up. So that's the foundation of our tank. We did all of this inside of the school initially. Um, and we did, we, we thought ahead. We were like, okay, we're going to move this at some point. we got to have an area where we can get out double doors. Um, so we put it in a place where we can get out double doors. Because it was in the school, we had to use grow lights. Um, so that's another expense you have to consider if you're doing a system inside of the school or inside of the building. They don't have to be nearly this big. You can use one, one IBC toe and like one section of grow beds and you would do the exact same thing. Um, again, right here we're painting them blue. Minimize the sunlight being moved through the system so I don't have a bunch of algae growing on every day. What's it? Where are these growers? Uh So right now it's moved in our greenhouse. I'll show you that here in just a little what bit. What is that? Um, this area right here, is, it's actually currently our weight room. It was just an old vacated section of the school. There was not a whole lot in there. Um, we used to have an art room in there, and the art room moved to an actual classroom, and like, we used to have a bunch of empty space. We're, we're going through a lot of districts. Are we over the last ten years? We've had declining enrollment, so we had extra space available in our school. Oh, and see where I, I know other schools are maybe not the same problem. We don't have any space. Yeah, I understand. Is the blue like unique, or is it just because it's okay? Uh, so my understanding is that the blue wavelength will not allow as much algae growth as what other things are. I could use black that wouldn't allow light to move through it, but then it would increase temperature inside my system as well. I, I'm not into wanting though. I don't want the water temperature to be a lot higher. Makes sense for power level. I suppose purple maybe do this would do the same thing at that end of the spectrum. Um, but again, darker color, more sunlight absorption, more heat. Yes. What is your class called? Like is it earth science? Like what class are you doing? This is ninth grade earth science. Uh, we, we offer a specific ninth grade earth science class. I know a lot of districts do like eighth grade earth science class, and some districts do it, uh, are transitioning into 11th and 12th grade based on the new uh, earth science standards. 
I could see where you use this in any class. I did, I, honestly, in my biology class, I can see more connections with biology than I even can for science. Um, when you start talking about cycling of matter and energy, and you start talking about biogeochemical cycles, and it's, all of those fall under your science realm, but I can talk about um, growth and development of plants, of organisms, life cycles, uh, nitrogen cycle would be under that earth science realm, even though it's not expressed in the science standards. Um, we still do stuff with the nitrogen cycle because I think it's good for a community of kids to have a high probability of going into a, a field that's in the farming industry or the ag industry for a kid to have a general understanding of the nitrogen cycle. Yeah. Are you building this outside of class then? Um, nope, we did this during class time. So we, we are on a block schedule. And because we're on a block schedule, there's usually a few minutes at the end of the day, 20, 30 minutes at the end of the day, where I'm like, okay, you guys have just checked out. I need to have something to do that's hands on. Um, most of my classrooms hands on, but like they just sometimes need that mental break. And so I've done this as a project long term with, with my kids in that class. Usually the last half hour to the last 20 minutes of almost every day or every other day. Uh, so this is just kids continuing to um, build the system. Right back here is a sump tank. You can't see it, it's kind of hidden. That's where all the water flows out all the way to that sump tank, and then the pump pumps it up. You can see the pipe dropping into the two IBC totes. These are uh, 275 gallon IBC totes. And then in the middle are 255 gallon barrels. Both of these tanks drain into the back barrel. The back barrel is a swirl filter. It's uh, just a, a way to catch all of the leftover debris from fish. So that tank needs to be drained every now and again because the fish poop will start building up back there. I've got a valve on it with a hook, uh, with a bulkhead connector on there. I just open up that valve, all that flushes out. It takes me a total of about 20 minutes, and I flush everything out, and it's cleaned up, and I don't have to do anything with the tank for a long time. Um, and then that water, as it runs out, uh, it, as it goes from the swirl filter, it rises up, and then comes out here, and it drops to the bottom of this barrel. And then inside this barrel, I have a whole bunch of um, mesh. Plastic mesh do not use um, any type of metal. Uh, aluminum is bad. Uh, any types of metal inside of your system uh, can kill your fish. Uh, so make sure that you stay away from metals inside of your system. So plastic uh, screen, it just leaves more area for bacterial growth. The water overfills at the top, dumps down into each one of these grow beds. And then it, on this side, it, it, uh, it's where it pours in. And on the back side, there's, again, just the drain that runs out. All it is is a standpipe. So the water runs up as high as that standpipe is and then flows over top. Um, I do take a piece of PVC and put it over top of the standpipe. So then it's pulling the water from the bottom of the tank up instead of just taking what's off the top, skimming off the top. Um, and there's a lot of information on YouTube and other resources on how to set up a, a pipe that's going to be pulling from the bottom and pulling all that debris that you're catching. That's my group of kids that built that. I know a small group, right? Uh, this is doing some transplanting and some plants. We got kids with green thumbs that love planting. Uh, that right there is just the expanded clay palette. All those are expanded clay palettes. We take the plants. Pop them in there, make sure the roots get down into uh, the water, and they do their thing. You can see the lights on the top as well. So we had artificial lighting for a while. Um, right there's the lights also. Currently, we do not have artificial lighting because we've moved all this out to our greenhouse that we finished construction um, in uh, December of last year, I guess. So materials, uh, this is just a general materials list. There's all kinds of avenues. There are all kinds of different ways that you can go. You can use your, your salmon for it. You can use trout, tilapia, ornamental fish, perch, bluegill, bass, catfish. You name it, you can do it. Um, there are some people that use crayfish in systems, and there are some people that use worms in their system. We did uh, transport some or transplant some worms, um, some decomposing worms inside of our system. They do a fantastic job of kind of cleaning up some of the leftover leaf matter. Um, plant species depends on your water temperature. If you're looking to build something big, <clears throat> mostly right there is what you're going to need. Net pot, screws, tools, PVC, wood, bulkhead connectors, aerators, water pumps. Um, 
If you're going to go small with your salmon tank, really all you need is a piece of inch and a half foam board, um, some net pots. You can get them on Amazon. They're dirt cheap, um, and you probably only need like eight of them, depending upon the size of your tank. Um, drill a bunch of holes in that uh, expanded foam board. Float it right on the top of your system. Make sure that your plants have sufficient sunlight. Uh, so this is our greenhouse that we've moved to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about funding because I think this is an important thing. Uh, so funding, you guys ask the community for help. Like, go to the community and be like, this is what I want to do, why I want to do it. And the reason I say that, um, our local community foundation is kind of what started all of our same in the classroom stuff. Uh, I would start there. Local community foundations, get on uh, Google, type in local community foundations for your county. You're going to get an entire list of different community foundations. And oftentimes what I've found is, depending upon your county, there's community foundations that have funds that are set aside that never get used because nobody asks for them. Uh, so start with your local community foundation. Um, sell yourself. Like, you're gonna be the weird salmon fish person in your district. Own it. I mean, I I'm the weird fish dude. Like last Christmas, I got, uh, I got uh, Swedish fish, uh, gummy worms, um, fish crackers, I got all kinds of stuff that were related to fish in my district. But anytime I go to my community and ask for something for what we're doing, my community supports me. Um, I think sometimes as teachers, we walk in the classroom, we shut the door, and we aren't open to saying what's or explaining what's happening in our classroom. Let your community know what you're doing. Let them know the cool stuff you're doing. Invite people into the classroom. Talk to your administration and say, hey, I want to do this with the community. Uh, your salmon in the classroom stuff, you do release day stuff at the end of the year. Go talk to your administrator about, hey, how can we make this work where I can let parents come in? Maybe they need to fill out a form for the district for the day. Maybe they don't because you might be releasing on a public area and we can't tell people that they can't show up in a public area. Um, so get, get some community input on things. Uh, get some community uh, support. Get a hold of your local businesses. You'd be amazed how many businesses are willing to just say, yeah, I got $500. This greenhouse right here, I raised $74,000 in less than a year for the building of that greenhouse. That greenhouse is uh, less than a year old, uh, a little bit old, older than a year. So we finished, I, I finished constructing it with these two hands last December. Um, we didn't quite raise enough money for me to hire somebody else to build it, so I built it on my prep time and after school. Uh, luckily, I have a brother that is in construction management, and I'm like, hey, how much time do you have to donate? Because I'm not um, And we had some of our maintenance guys help as well. Uh, so that greenhouse is a 30 by 60 greenhouse. Um, it is concrete floored, and we have our aquaponic system in it now. We have pools in it. This section over here that you can't see from the direction I'm taking the picture uh, is all a bunch of tables with plants growing on it right now. Um, we're, we're doing a lot of different flowers that we're doing for sale. And our community rallied behind it because we're a farming agricultural community that had no farming or agricultural instruction in the classroom. Uh, and so our community was like, yeah, sure. I wrote letters. I said I'd raise ten thousand dollars from the community foundation for the construction of the greenhouse to benefit our kids. Uh, we want to do something bigger and a little better than what we initially planned. Would you be willing to uh, sponsor us in some way? I had checks rolling in with two weeks for thousand dollars, over and over and over again. I had some coming in for two hundred dollars. I had some coming in for five hundred dollars. Uh, Trade Wind Energy Company, when you're heading south on one twenty-seven. You see all the wind turbines. Our district's right in that area. Um, we are just to the east of those wind turbines on one twenty-seven. Uh, Trade Wind Energy Company was planning on a facility uh, on a wind farm in our community, and they ended up not coming into our community. But they, I sent them a letter because I knew they were coming. They sent us a thousand dollars. They never even came into our community. So, um, sell yourself. Like, tell them what you're doing with salmon in the classroom. Say this is a really cool project. This is how it's working in my classroom. These are the things the kids are learning. I need some extra funds to be able to purchase purchase X, Y, and Z. Uh, you will be amazed at how much your community comes behind you and supports you. I'm not even lying. Um, just ask for help. Um, another thing there is, become a grant writer, start seeking things out. But if you're not a grant writer, go to your community foundations, and talk to whoever's in charge there, and say, hey, uh, this is what I want to do. What's your recommendation? What do you have? And a lot of times the grant writing process isn't overly good. Um, so this right here is actually really interesting. Did you know that rainbow trout eggs are shipped not in water? That right there, rainbow trout eggs. That's how they come. Overnight air. 
they come in cheese cloth with a little bit of ice sitting over the top of them, so it keeps dripping on them. I was like, first time I got that, I was like, they've got to be all dead. Um, but I heard there's 5,000 rainbow trout in We do not keep all of our rainbow trout. We don't <laughs> all make it. Um, but we do pretty good. So you have to be okay with failure. Uh, there will be mistakes that are made. Um, some of the other things you need to consider is, am I doing this outside or inside? Am I doing this on my salmon tank? If so, what am I going to do for some type of artificial lighting that isn't going through the salmon tank causing algae to grow like crazy? Um, foam board is fantastic for many things. Put foam board all over stuff, insulates it for heat, and it also will insulate it to keep the light from coming in and uh, algae growing. Um, so for me right now with our aquaponics stuff, we're in the greenhouse. There is a time commitment. Um, you're going to find that you're doing more research than kids are all the time. Um, I get on YouTube all the time and look at other people's systems. Like, what are you guys doing? How are you doing it? I'll, I'll email stuff period, uh, email people periodically. Uh, one of the guys I got the majority of my information from is a missionary in Honduras. And he sets up systems very similar to that in local community gardens. They raise tilapia, and then they raise a whole bunch of plants in that system. And uh, there's a number of things they do slightly different to theirs, but uh, they end up taking the fish and laying them out and having like community dinners. Uh, they take the, the plants and they do community dinners with those as well, or if people are in need, they send them out. So you talk about real low income areas are using this as a food resource um, and building them in community type centers. Um, there are some initial expenses depending upon what you do, but I tell you, don't go big initially. Start small. Start on a real small scale and then slowly build onto things. Our salmon and classroom project right now that we run didn't start with as many tanks as what we have in the first year. It was very small, low-key, low one tank, a little bit of support from the community foundation, and every year we built on it. So just be okay with the fact that it might take you some time. Um, planning research, big thing for kids is they're going to need to do a lot of research. What, what, how do each one of these, we, we talked about earlier about how you have to have biodiversity. Well, in these systems, it's very similar. You need to figure out what's eating what and how is that being recycled and who's doing what in that ecosystem. It's really a small scale ecosystem. Uh, so it's been really cool watching my kids discover things and how other organisms interact with each other um, on, on this kind of small scale. Resources. So I've got a website set up that's on that stuff. Feel free to use any of my resources. I've got a student blog that's on there to kind of explain some of the things they've done, and there's a couple of things I haven't even uploaded from like what the kids did this semester. Um, Bright Agrotech, they specialize in um, in aquaponics systems. Check out their their uh, information. This this whole slide is linked on that sheet that I sent around. Um, so if you Take a picture of the, the slides. You can actually just click on these and, and link to them. Um, Mur, uh, Murray Hamal, he's got a whole bunch of information on aquaponics. He calls his site Practical Aquaponics. He on YouTube, he's got a website. Uh, get a hold of other teachers. Um, when I first started getting into this, there were uh, there were people in other portions of the country that were doing projects like this, but there wasn't really standards for it, and there wasn't really a whole lot of information about it. Um, there is some stuff as far as like an elementary curriculum that's been designed in the country of Australia. Uh, and so I've, I've started like networking with people around the state and around the country and around the world just saying, hey, how do I go about doing this with my kids in the classroom? Um, and then like I mentioned earlier, the Aquaculture Challenge, Lake Superior State does it. Elliot Nelson's at MSU, Barbara Evans, is, Dr. Barbara Evans is at Lake Superior State. They kind of team up to do that, that project. If you have a team that's interested, maybe get a little information on it. This might be linked to last year's material. They are doing another competition this year. Um, I would I'd read up about it. There's a registration deadline by uh, January 30th. Um, so read up about it if you're interested in it. You've got kids that are maybe interested in it, you can do it outside of school. Um, and then there's all kinds of stuff on YouTube. Pinterest, Twitter, lots of resources out there. And this is just us being future driven. Each year it just changes for us. We, we do something and then next year we try to do a little bit better. Um, questions? I, I, I know I've rambled for a very long time. I have a habit of doing that. Steve? Uh, you mentioned earlier about like eight pots or something like that for a salmon tank. You know, I know the you know the, the ability to uptake the nutrients is supposed to be ultra high. You know, for these plants and the density of fish you see in these is 
usually super high in these in these tanks. Yep. And even though salmon tanks like seem heavy stocked, you know, I don't think they really are in comparison to some of that stuff. So was that a you know the idea being like literally a a foam board with eight pots with lettuce grown out of them? I mean, can that is that idea that, that can actually control the nitrogen accumulation even in a salmon tank? So or would it be, need to be more ambitious. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't have a perfect answer for you. Um, the the information that I run with is one inch of, of fish per gallon. Um, and for every one inch of fish per gallon, um, you should have an equal amount of biomass to plants. When I'm doing stuff, when I started this with my salmon tank, what I was really trying to do was just get rid of as much of that nitrate as I could. Sure. Um, and so... If I've got a bunch of plants, get rid of as much nitrate as I can, I'm helping out my system I'm in the nitrogen cycle. And so my goal was really just to try to keep more fish surviving. It wasn't so much on the plant aspect. We've only transitioned to try and do more with plants because our project got bigger. Did you um, ever outstrip it? Did you ever have the plants growing quick, too quickly to the point where they would... I, I, it's actually been the opposite in the salmon tank. Okay. Um, the op they don't grow near fast enough. The plants. Um, there's not enough nutrient from the salmon tank. Uh, to get okay. your plants to grow fast enough. Um, so it's it's been more of, hey kids, look what we can do. Why is that happening? It's happening because the plants are uptaking the nitrates, which are produced in the process of the nitrogen cycle. I haven't gone so far as being like, I'm going to mass produce this and I'm going to get a, a good crop in the long run. Yeah. We're exploring. Um, if I was trying to do this to make money, then I would say, well, I'm not, not worried, worried about the crop. crop. I'm more worried about the super pure salmon tank water. Yeah. You know? <laughs> If any crop grows in the in the water vein super pure from the salmon and it's less work, mm -hmm. I and mean, that's that's pretty huge. Yep. Yeah. Um, with the plants that you experimented with, they're mostly animals, it seems. Um, I didn't know. I, I thought I may have seen one picture that showed roots coming right through the pot, yep. into the water. But did you have any? Um, I don't know. Increased um, or evidence of increased nitrate uptake when you have plants that come right. They have roots that come right down into the water as opposed to me just sitting up in the pot. Yeah. Getting everything through that way. So I have had with some of the systems trying to find that one. Um, so with some of these systems, I have found that one right there. Uh, that one's got some roots coming down. Those uh, are herbs. There's one, what's that? Those are herbs. Uh, those are beans. Oh. And there's a few herbs in there. There's one tomato one, or uh, one um, uh, strawberry in that one. This is these are soybeans. The kid that was like super interested in soybeans because his dad farmed soybeans, and so he brought soy soybeans in. Um, so on these systems, when the roots start growing, uh, mm -hmm. what you'll find is, especially even with uh, like tilapia and um, goldfish, they'll start eating the roots, mm -hmm. and they'll start picking at the roots, and the roots will start not growing nearly as well. Um, this system does not have any filter on it at all. All this is is the roots growing down and working as the filter to pull that nitrate out. Uh, the other filtration that's taking place is down in the rock and get down below. And any bacteria that are growing on those little objects, there is an aerator in there because I want to get lots of oxygen to the roots of the plants. The greater the amount of oxygen in the roots of the plants, the, the quicker you're going to know the plants growing. As far as the same professor um, set up, I, I, I am thinking about, you know, if there's a plant out there, maybe even like a native like floating or submerged in aquatic that, that would there, there are some ornamental floating um, type flowers that you can get. Um, I've drawn a blank of their name. I should have taken a picture of them. I've got them all over in my floor. What's that? Hyacinth is one of them. There's another one too, but it's just floating. They just float on the top of the water. The root system goes down. You, if you can get sufficient sunlight into those without too much sunlight getting into your water, creating algae growth, I, I think you'd be cool with I think it'd work out really well. The big thing is, the more sunlight you're getting into the water, the greater amount of uh, probability you have of having algae growth in your hand. Yeah. So, when you're trying a small thing like this, I wouldn't need to run a filter. I could just have the pots going down and growing. I, I would recommend running a filter, just a little one in the back. Yeah. Um, but you don't necessarily have to. I could just be one running on the back filter. Yep. And then on my salmon tank, I have a canister filter. Let it run. I would it. still run that. And fill the pots in there. Because even in those canister filters, you're still getting nitrate in the long run. I mean, that nitrate's coming out the back end of that filter, the back end of the nitrogen cycle. And so your nitrates can be taken up by those by those plant roots. And so we buy a bacteria. 
Oh, yeah. for, for you guys, I would say if it's something you're really interested in, give it a try. Do an experiment for a year. Pull off the lid of your fish tank, put a bunch of expanded foam board on there, play pots in there. Everything you, I bet you could do this for $150 by the time you got on Amazon and ordered some things um, on your salmon tank and do some romaine lettuce and see how it goes. I mean, the worst that can happen is your plants don't make it and you put a new lid on top of your, your salmon tank. And you, and you spend a little money. It's our first year in salmon. So I'm comfortable doing it for <laughs> You yeah, haven't gotten to that point where you're okay with killing them all like I am. Right? No, yeah, no, I get, I get real mad at her. <laughs> Stop killing the fish. Okay, yeah. One more question. Do you recommend gravel in those types of situations? Uh, that's a long story. So, so, so I'd say the reason that you have in your pamphlet not using gravel is due to me. Um, I think I maybe told you guys that. Um, I know that Steve is probably cursing at me right now in his head because uh, he wants gravel inside a tank. So because I was not running a they weren't running a filter in this one, we put a fil uh, gravel in the bottom to increase surface area for bacterial growth. Um, so, so, so Steve, he, he's throwing darts at me right now because he wants gravel in those tanks. And I was the person that said to Shana about 10 years ago, I'm so sick of gravel. Because I, I had a teacher coming in every single day at 6 o'clock in the morning. He'd get to school early, and I wouldn't get there until 7. And he was coming in, and he was feeding my fish, and I didn't know it. And I had gravel all over in the bottom. Well, what happened is by the time I got to school at 7, when he was feeding them at 6, all that fish food sunk down to the bottom and got in gravel, and I didn't notice it. And it got up underneath stuff, and the fish ate what they could. And about a month and a half, two months in, after he'd been doing this, I show up at 6 o'clock in the morning, he's in there feeding my fish, my lights are on, I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I've been feeding your fish. I'm like, why are you feeding my fish? He's like, oh, I've been doing it for months. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no wonder I'm having pneumonia issues. Because I'm getting twice the amount of feed that I really need. And so from that situation, I'm like, I pull all the gravel out. And it's so much easier to siphon all that extra food off at the bottom than try to mess with it in the gravel. So you can talk to Steve about uh, having gravel. I'm going to keep telling you I don't want gravel. And maybe one day Steve can change me my mind. But for now, I'm going to gravel. Yes, sir. Uh, I started with a lot of school and uh, I borrowed a lot of stuff and we got 40 gallon breeder tanks. Yep. And we bought mortar trays from uh, Home Depot. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were using the grind with the golf site. Yep. It was supposed to be great. It was a curve. Super cool. My question to you is congratulations on your greenhouse. Thank you. We're trying to. We would like to actually do a bigger scale like you're doing. Is it a whole box when you write a grant and say you want to raise the audience or let us use in the cafeteria? That's a great question. I'm actually working right now with our cafeteria, uh, uh, the person that's in charge of our cafeteria. <laughs> They're trying to answer some of the questions. Um, or the uh, yes, on the legalities of it um, in harvesting. There's some things that are written in there as far as as long as you harvest it with one swoop and you're not ending up splashing water. In it. Like, so there's some really weird ways that you can harvest things, and we're not positive that we can use it in the school. We can sell it to community members or just give it away to like local churches or organizations that are that are doing food banks. Um, and what we've done a lot of times is we've taken like lettuce and we, we package it and then we'll uh, use one of those uh, things that suck all the air out of it and, we'll, and it lasts a little bit longer. We have a vacuum sealer and we'll, we'll send it to the local church and say, hey, do you have somebody that can use this? Uh, we've got cherry tomatoes like crazy, so we'll package those and we'll package some of the lettuce as well. Uh, my lettuce is actually overgrown right now. I keep, I keep pulling out the, the lady in our cafeteria. I think we can do it. I think we can do it. I don't know what to do with it yet. Tell me what to do. So we were smart. That's perfectly fine. And if anybody's ever interested in just stopping by and seeing what we're doing, I will always know what you guys are doing. I will schools. I'm right here. So I've used up all of my time, which I tend to do. Um, we are north of Lansing. We're right between Mount Pleasant and Lansing. I can find my spy. I got a lot of spies. There we go. That's us. Right there. Okay. So thank you all for listening to me ramble. I apologize for taking much time. You're welcome.